Yes, that's what I need today, my friends, is a deep breath. It's been a rather challenging day, and uh, I'm a little late getting started, and I apologize for that. But anyway, here we are. My name is David McLeod. I'm your Life Mastery Coach, and uh, this is Soul Empowerment, episode number 39, if you can believe it. And we're calling this one Opening the Kimono. So I, I don't want to say specifically what I mean by that, but I think I, I explained that in our write-up, so he hopefully everybody will understand. Um, and as you can see, well, we've got uh, Scott uh, Holmes is going to be joining us here shortly, and uh, that makes two new faces that we have. So I'm going to ask Gail to introduce herself first. Welcome, Gail, and thank you for joining the Soul Empowerment team. Thank you for inviting me and having me. I'm excited for this conversation on opening the kimono. And um, since I'm one of the new faces, you don't, if you don't know me, I am a transformational visibility coach. I work with new earth leaders, guiding them to transform the way they communicate and to show up authentically and vulnerably and powerfully um, in order to fulfill their soul mission and have an impact on on creating the new earth that sounds awesome and i'm so glad that you were able to find the space to join us gail i know you've got a lot going on in your life too and uh so welcome to the team and i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing what we create together and i see scott is there too welcome scott uh welcome yeah i've been going through some technical challenges of my own today so i know what's i know what it's like uh anyway you are another one of our new faces here on the Soul Empowerment team, and I just want to welcome you. Please introduce yourself so people know who you are and uh, what you bring to the table. Scott Holmes. Uh, David and I have been an author um, on, uh, on books uh, with Brave Healer Productions. I am a Reiki master, uh, do a number of different modalities, but it's about healing and energy healing. Um, when, I, when I listen to what Gail does and Sarah does and you do. Um, it seems that I take a lot of what you do and bring it into my practice much the same. And it's all about uh, healing and sharing uh, our knowledge and our experiences. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and especially with the three of you. Well, thank you, Scott, and I'm glad you're able to join us. And of course, last but by no means least, my good friend, Sarah. Sarah, you've been a part of this team now for several months, and uh, I know people probably are already aware of who you are, but why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself anyway? Uh, it's just over a year, so sort of thank you very much indeed. And, and great to be with all, all three of you. Um, like Scott, I work with sort of Reiki energy. I work with energy, but I also work with the energy of sound, the use of the voice, toning. Um, and it is about... For me, it's about supporting people to help themselves um, in their own lives um, with, with their own healing journey. And it comes from my own healing journey, because I think you'll find with all of us, we've all not very, very normal lives and like everybody else. <laughs> um, and but we've something, something has happened and we've We've stepped forward into a journey of our own that supported us to be able to do what we're here, here doing today. Um, and, th and that's what I'm here to do. I'm, I personally don't like the word service. Um, I'm here to help people to do things for themselves. <laughs> I'm right. not here to do it for them. Um, but, but then that's, that's my perspective on the word service, um, having worked in many service industries. Um, so. Yes, I'm, I'm here to help people, especially connect with and heal the inner child, the trauma, the hurt and the pain of our younger years. Beautiful, Sarah. And I, and I really like what you say about um, we're all, I think, uh, coming from that same idea of not imposing or putting into people the ideas of how they can grow and, and live better lives, but rather of drawing it out of them. And I think that's the actual true uh, meaning of the word educating, educating, which it really means to lead out. If you look at the Latin uh, derivation of the word, it means to lead out. And, and I think that's what really true education is about. And I think that's what we're about here. 
all of us. We're here to help people find that truth within themselves and bring that forth in a more genuine and authentic manner. And that's really where the nature of this topic really came up because I remember, Sarah, you suggested it at the beginning. You, you suggested, well, why don't we talk about our own stories and, and how we got where we are? And I think that's a great, in fact, that's a great place to start. And each of us has already shared a little bit about that and maybe uh, more or less of it in other venues. Um, but I'm going to ask you, Sarah, to maybe start that process and share with us your story and how you got where you are. And let's try and keep it to you know a max of about three or four minutes a piece so that we can uh, begin the conversation in a more deep manner. OK, thank you. Um, I was born into a, a young family. I was the firstborn, uh, firstborn daughter. But I had there was an accident uh, and it was a pretty nasty accident when I was less than a year old. And I got scalded by a boiling milk coffee that went all over my face and down my neck. And the jumper I was wearing stuck to my skin. So the result was that I ended up by being hospitalized for three months. Now we're talking 64 years ago. And this was at a time when the hospital said, parents can visit for an hour every other day. The reality for me with my parents was they came and saw me for an hour once a week. Now they know now the trauma but actually, yes, it, it, it's considerably more than that, um, that occurs to children. It's abuse. It really is abuse. And the, what that did to me, but when I came out of hospital, my parents had moved. So I didn't go home to familiar surroundings. My mother was expecting my sister, Gillian. Gillian died when she was nine weeks old. That was all by the time I was 18 months old. So that just felt like rejection after rejection to a little girl who had no understanding of the circumstances that they were out of my parents' control. Um, as an adult, we can un come to understand these things, but until you are in that place of understanding, and so, yes, my sister Katie was born a year sort of after Gillian was born, um, sort of mum then miscarried and then my sister Jackie was born and she's six years younger than me. And then mum miscarried another one and they believe they were both boys. She couldn't carry boys. Um, so I had my grandparents. They lived relatively close. I lived a, a relatively normal life, but a very unhappy, insecure life. My mother sent me a couple of photos only last week saying, oh, I thought you'd like these. They would bring back good memories. And I looked at them and I thought, well, I am guessing that's me and that's Katie. And we were young children. And I'm guessing that that's Chris and that's Helen um, because they were the children of my grandparents' neighbors. But I couldn't, it was, it was guesswork. Mm -hmm. There was no memory. And I went back to mummy and said, oh, this brought, brought lovely memories. I said, mummy, I have no memories. Mm -hmm. I blocked out so much of my childhood because of the hurt, the pain and the trauma. Not her fault. I don't put blame on anyone. But I think I come from a relatively normal background. It is just that the trauma of childhood affected me massively until the trauma until the trauma of my wake up call which then woke me up but that was that was my beginning um and it was a very unhappy unfulfilled people pleaser until i was about 40. so yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was yeah so it was pretty normal other than that <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that, Sarah. I know, you know, you and I have talked about this before, and so I am familiar with your story, but our viewers may not be. And I think there probably is somebody out there who had a very similar experience at some point in their life, maybe not with exactly the same details, but, you know, we all go through these kinds of challenges of maybe not necessarily connecting with our parents in the most loving way. Um, and so before I go into any more conversation about your situation, I'd like to give each of our other 
uh, panelists an opportunity to speak. So I'm going to move next to you, uh, Scott, if you'd like to share a little bit about your story and, and what led you onto the path that you're on today. Um, very, very normal upbringing, very, very wonderful. Um, fam small family, four, one of four. But after I got married, um, went through some traumas. My, you talk about serve and how do you define it? Well, I was taught that, especially for my mom, that to serve meant to love. And so you did for other people. Um, my, my third daughter uh, got ill um, and, and almost passed. Um, and she survived at 18 months old. And she was um, brain damaged. And so she spent uh, the rest of her 13 and a half years in um, institutions, either in a hospital or, or medical facility. And through that, my wife and I went went through that, and we had the older two daughters. And then she was uh, had came down with breast cancer. She was at 38 years old. She they were luckily found it. Uh, she was stage three at the time, and and um, it started a 20 year battle with breast cancer. So um, those traumas with the women in my life, uh, but always being the caregiver, always being giving of yourself. Um, and as, as all of those people in the audience know, when you're a caregiver, you literally give up yourself and a lot of yourself. Um, all of those, those dreams and ideals that I had about what married life could be uh, and what uh, a kind of a normal family could be with vacations in the summer and, you know, uh, doing all those things uh, didn't happen because more important things in when you have your health, you have everything. My grandparents used to say that never believed them. I was immortal when I was 20 years old. I, nothing could happen to me at 25 years old. I lost more my mortality when my daughter got sick. And then after everything we went through my wife, after my wife passed, that's when I found out that I looked at me and didn't know who or what I was. I had been serving all my life and I have no regrets to that. However, now I needed to find out who I was. And so I started the journey. And the first thing was Reiki. And, and Reiki, I, I say that Reiki saved my life, but it, it brought life back to me. And that emptying out, David, what you had said about education is leading out. And it's leading out of yourself. It's going out of yourself, it, but also finding the within. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, having been in this field for the last six years, uh, has brought me to meet everyone here and open up my entire life. I, as a matter of fact, in in two weeks, I'm heading to India for 17 days. So um, nice. it's one of those spiritual journeys. So that's what I do. And I my whole job in my life now is to educate other people so they can find their journey, so they can solve the problems because they have the answers. They know the answers. They're within them. It's just taking away all the garbage that's in front of them so they can see it. Right. Well, beautiful. Thank you, Scott, for sharing that. And, uh, you know, we're going to come back to these stories. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. But I want to give everybody a chance to speak first. So, Gail, why don't you go ahead and share a little bit about uh, your story, how you ended up where you are today, and uh, you need to unmute yourself there. Yeah, well, I want to first thank Sarah and Scott, because I haven't heard your stories. Um, so thank you for sharing so openly and candidly. And I have to say that I resonate a lot with Sarah's story, um, different details, definitely. I also resonate Scott and Sarah. Um, I would say that this whole normal, normal looking life uh, looks good on paper. That was definitely how things looked externally in my world and internally. The truth is that I grew up, I was born into a toxic, dysfunctional, abusive family from, from the get-go. Um, I, I, you know, addiction and, and, and abuse is kind of part of the lineage on on my paternal side. And I imagine that there's probably mental health issues on, on my maternal side and probably a lot of things that I don't even know about. Um, but for me personally, uh, the 
my awareness of that toxicity and that neglect and that abuse really hit me when I was nine years old, um, when it was being directed to me. And I was really terrified to speak up about that at first because even though I wasn't quite sure as a young child what was going on, I could sense that if I did speak up about it, it would disrupt the family and I didn't want to be the person who did that. And I stayed silent about it for about five years until really I couldn't, I couldn't keep it to myself any longer. I couldn't keep quiet any longer. And when I finally told my family what was going on, everything that I was afraid would happen actually didn't happen. Uh, my abuser denied everything. My family didn't believe me. They swept it all under the rug as if nothing happened at all. And that didn't even occur to me as a possibility. You know, I, I sort of imagined, hey, I'm going to get taken out of the home. I'm going to be put in foster, you know, the, the big scary thing. When in fact, the big scary thing was that nothing happened. And basically, I was on my own to keep myself safe right. in a very unsafe environment. And, um, my way of doing that was was being really stealth and making myself invisible and <laughs> you know not not being a target of the abuse right until i was able to leave and go to college and and what have you um and that served you know being invisible actually served me so it's no wonder that i'm now helping people be seen be heard and feel safe doing that because I had to go through my own journey of that. Um, what I want to say is that, you know, this, this feeling of rejection and abandonment it is really difficult for a child to reconcile. It's really difficult for a child to reconcile. And we all experience rejection and abandonment throughout our life, right? Um, but when you're a child who doesn't get the tools or the support or the guidance and you're kind of left to figure it all out on your own, that can continue to play out in in your present day life. And that's really what was going on for me. I didn't recognize it at first, but ultimately I got to a point we're going to talk about uh, wake up calls later. But I got to a point where I recognized, ooh, all of my survival and coping mechanisms are actually running the show in my present, in my business, in my relationships, in my life. Um, and right. it wasn't, it served me at a time that it needed to serve me. And I held on to it and it wasn't serving me anymore. And it was time to really let that go. And that was all about trust and surrender and learning how to be more me. Um, which was terrifying at the time <laughs> and learning how to be vulnerable, learning how to let down my guard. And yeah, it, it, it's, it seems counterintuitive to come from a background where you don't feel safe and the way that you survive is to be armored up and to be hypervigilant and to hide yourself and that the way to heal that, the medicine in that, is to actually be even more trusting and more vulnerable and learning how to really speak for your truth and your needs and how your and and your desires and your wants. <laughs> so that's really kind of how I've gotten into the space of being a visibility coach. Um, also working a lot with energy. I do take an energy first approach because personally, I believe that we all have times where we, we work and operate from our default energy, our default patterns. And right. that's just part of being human. And to have somebody who's not hooked into that and who is kind of a separate from that, who can guide you through a process to get you more in that empowered energy can can be so validating and transformational and that's why i love the work that i do well beautiful thank you gail for sharing and uh well for anybody out there who has gone through any kind of abuse physical sexual emotional verbal whatever it might be 
I'm sure you can resonate with some of what you just heard. Um, my story is is one of those ones where I, I I would tell myself, well, geez, I didn't have sexual abuse. I didn't get beat up. I didn't suffer like that. So really, what right do I have to complain about anything? Um, you know, that was kind of my attitude uh, for most of my life, actually. But as I began doing my personal growth work, starting in around 1997, and uh, began unraveling some of the belief systems that I had, I came to, un and, and going through a major uh, cathartic experience through the Mankind Project called the New Warrior Training Adventure. That all led me to understand how I got to that place. And it took quite a few years of unraveling really to understand. And what it came down to, and I know this is gonna sound maybe silly even to some people, it came back to a, an event that happened when I was only three years old. Three years old, what do three-year-olds do? They, well, I can't speak for all three-year-olds. I know I was a pretty uh, rebellious young boy. And uh, I always wanted to do things my way. I wanted to, you know, so on and so on. Well, my mom got exasperated with me for whatever reason. I'm sure this wasn't the first time she'd gotten upset with me uh, and was trying to get me back to behave. She was trying to get me under her control. And, uh, you know, she had done all her typical things like, you know, I'm your mother, you're supposed to listen to me and all that kind of stuff. And I guess at one point she kind of grabbed me, she stood me up on, on our changing table in, the, in my bedroom, I guess. And she just looked me right in the eye and she said, listen to me, young man, I want you to hear me very, very clearly. I know you better than you know yourself. Well, that sounds pretty innocuous, right? And I think most, most people today would say, well, yeah, you know, at that age, mommy probably does know the kid better than he or she knows herself. But for at the time, I didn't really understand the meaning of those words. I just imagine in my adult mind of today that I was thinking something along the lines of, oh, yeah, well, you're my mom. You know me better than anybody else does. You take care of all my needs. You make sure that I am protected and safe and I have all the food and the clothing and everything else that I need. I mean, I obviously those words didn't come into my mind at, at three years old, but that's what I'm, I'm thinking now. So I guess you do know me better than I know myself. But then as a three-year-old, I probably had this other reasoning process that said, well, if mommy knows me better than I know myself, then daddy knows me better than I know myself too. And then of course I started adding other people, you know, grandma and grandpa know me better than I know myself. My teacher, Miss Brown knows me better than I know myself. The father Joe knows me better than I know myself. And before you know it, I have convinced myself that everybody knows me better than I know myself. And so my life became a process of looking to others to tell me what to do, how to behave, and more than that, to help me understand what I wanted and needed. I did not rely on my own sovereignty at all. Okay, that's, that's the setup. But here's what happened over the next 40 years. I continued to believe in that pattern and I kept looking to other people to tell me what I wanted and needed. I would never say, I want to go to a movie. I would say, hey, would you like to go to a movie? I would always put it on the other person to make the choice. So I would kind of very, very surreptitiously try and get my wants and needs declared. But in the process of growing up, I also noticed that other people Perhaps people like Gail, if she had been in my life, let's say, seemed to be able to express their wants and needs, seemed to be able to, to be true to who they were, really were, didn't seem to be looking outwardly to find the truth. And I started thinking, well, how come they get to do that and I don't? So I began to see myself as a victim. <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that, but everybody else is, was the kind of thinking that went on. And before you know it, I start getting resentful and angry and resentful and angry. And by the time I was in my 40s, that's when it all just blew up. And I'm not gonna go into the details of what happened there, but that was the start of my wake up call. My understanding that 
hey, I'm a really angry guy and I don't know how I got this way and I need to do something about it. So my work became trying to answer that question. Who am I really? Same as you, Scott, same as you. We got there a different way, but we got to the same question. And I think that's really what this whole conversation is about. How we all, in one way or another, took on some belief systems based on the, the story we were living at the time and then limited ourselves in some way, you know? So even though I wasn't afraid to be seen, Gail, I was afraid to be seen as who I really was. So I would pretend to be someone else and I would, I would try to be the fun guy, the, you know, the humorous guy, the, the smart guy, the, you name it, the successful guy. I would try all those things and sometimes I, I succeeded and sometimes I didn't. But I think all of us found a way to cope in our lives with something that started way back when we were children. And what I'm, what I'm hoping that people get out of today's show is that all of us, every single one of us on the planet, we all have a story. We all have a series of experiences and events and circumstances and situations that happened in our lives that contributed to get us to where we are now. But what we're here to tell you today is that, well, I can speak for myself. I know I am not my story. I am not the story. What I am is the, the author of everything that's happened up till now. And there's all kinds of stuff in the future that hasn't been written yet. And so the real question is, what am I going to do with that? And that I'm hoping is what everybody else here will get from this conversation. So I'm going to open it up now and I'm just going to say, who would like to just dive in? I mean, I'm sure I can see everybody nodding there and I'm sure somebody has got something to say. So I'm just going to open it and let's see where it goes. I'll come in. It's about learned behaviors, isn't it? It was self-preservation. You know, whatever the circumstances we've been through, I became a people pleaser with the hope that people would like me, love me, you know, accept me, but I never expected it to last. I've got two marriages behind me because of that. They were self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah, exactly. Self-fulfilling. Don't expect a relationship to last. Don't expect anything to last. And that's why I was one of these people. I wanted everything yesterday because I knew it wouldn't last. And that was the joy of the wake up call was very much broken jaw, six, didn't know it was broken for a week, thanks to the dentist extracting a wisdom tooth. Um, and the result was, well, we've lost David. Um, <laughs> the result was six months of pain and sleepless nights. I hadn't got the energy to keep going with the people pleaser, you know, Gratefully, I never had children. Um, it, it, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't the right thing for me. I probably wasn't meant to have them in this life anyway. But I still ran a home, worked full time, was studying accountancy and was a people pleaser. I hadn't got the energy for it all. And, and then it was, a, how, why have I been the way I've been? And so I did ask to go and see a psychotherapist. And I only went for 10 months because actually I moved away from from there anyway, because I broke the marriage up. Um, and she said to me, what you have achieved in 10 months, most people can't achieve in two years. It's because I went for answers about me. There was no blame. I wasn't trying to blame anybody else. I wasn't looking for what had, what had I done or what hadn't I done or what had other people done. It was about just understanding what had happened in my life and trying to learn about that. And then I found Reiki. Um, it was amazing because the first person you treat when you learn is yourself. And somehow I knew it was what can I do for me, not what can others do for me. Right. And that for me was the important thing. Um, and I learned about Reiki, sound, toning, metamorphic technique, loads of other things. And they've all been part of my healing journey, my finding myself. Right. And what I've realized is that 
a lot of people say, what's my life purpose? And I actually think our life purpose is to be who we are. Our journey is our gift, not just to ourselves, but to the rest of the world. So we are the gift. We are our life purpose. Um, when we can go back into and find, for me, that perfect being we were born to be, that the circumstances of our life actually sort of, yeah, the kimono. It's that all that rubbish, I'm not going to swear, all that rubbish that was chucked on top of us and it's peeling off those layers of the onion and getting yeah. rid of them, allowing the tears, you know, allowing yourself. It's not a matter of going into sort of poor me. It's a matter of, okay, this is what's happened in my life. What can I take from this? How can I grow from this? And I do feel I've, I'm still doing it. Don't get me wrong. I haven't got there. I'm still doing it. That's but right. mm -hmm. from the place I'm at, as with each and every one of you, at the, from the place I'm at, I can support people that are ready and at the right place in their time and feel I'm the right person for them. And that's the joy of there being so many of us because people can find the people that resonate with them. Beautiful. And the story speaks to them and they think, yes, this person actually gets it. It's not about the story per se, it's the feelings we had and how we behaved. And that I think is what people resonate with. Beautiful. Thank you, uh, Sarah. So Scott, it looks like you're ready to share something. Would you like to uh, offer your perspective? Well, every, every time Sarah talks, um, I, I take notes and I, and I have about 15 points every time that she talks that, that resonate with me because she, she just, we, we, we're in that same vibration. So all of these learned traits, we, we bring them into our marriages. We bring them into our relationships and, what I'm, what I'm finding, especially with clients and with myself, is that they're afraid to be um, selfish. And, and my family, when I started this journey, said, well, you're not the same person. Because I gave everything of myself, all of my time, everything. You know, my, my daughters would say, Dad, and I automatically reach into my pocket for money. So, it, it, you know, it was just that automatic response um, because I was always giving. And when I said, time out, I need time for me, they didn't understand. I had friends who kind of walked away. When I started on this journey, you lose mm -hmm. people who, hmm, maybe they were not around for the right reasons. Maybe they were there because of what I was giving and, and not getting. I was never asking in return. I never asked for myself. I only gave. And in doing this, starting this journey, ever since my wife passed, and, and I was with a therapist for five years, and I went every week for five years. And she, she actually cried when I, when we ended, but it, it was peeling all those layers in, in being able to tell my story without having the, the emotion overwhelm me. I didn't even know I had feelings back then because I suppressed them all because mm -hmm. of everything I'd gone through. No, no feelings, put them in a lock box, put them away. Look at, if you're going into an ER and you're, you're in a life of death situation, you put everything outside and you worry about the person that's there. When you're right. serving, you just take all the emotions, any fear, any, any of that, you put it away, you put it in a box. And all of a sudden, all of these boxes are opening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, had, I had thought I had uh, put them away. I thought, you know, you put them away, you don't have to deal with them again. Oops, there you go. So all these boxes were opening and the therapist helped me do that. And in the, in the meantime, I, I, I found Ricky and, and I started doing all that. And in the first books when we were writing, I wanted to tell my story. I desperately needed to tell my story. And now when I write, it's not about my story. It's about the journey. Not what it was, it's what is. And right. that person that I have become is so different, thank goodness, than the person I was. Uh, I, I know, David, you said you were always angry you were you were you know you you were hothead you, you didn't understand it 
and I would I was the authority authority figure. I was the judge. All right, we're going to do this. We're going to do it this. Way, and we're going to do it this way. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Okay, and that I demanded that of people around me. And I didn't realize it. So all of this coming back into myself and understanding have given me patience, compassion, and the ability to deal with everything and everyone in my life in a much, much, much different way. And when you open that vulnerability, that kimono, right? When you open that up, life is better. It's scary. First few times you do that, you go, oh, <laughs> no, what's coming? But when you do that, all of a sudden, the people that resonate with who you truly are come into your life. Exactly. And they're attracted to that. Life becomes so much easier. Oh, my gosh. So that's what I would give to, to people out there is opening allows a happier, easier life. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Scott. You know, the couple of things you said that just hit me and I, you talk about people walking away partway through your, your journey. I certainly had some of that. In fact, I was one of the people who walked away. But as I was thinking about you as you were speaking, I was thinking, Consider the people who I, who we attracted into our lives. You know, obviously I had people in my life who were quite happy to be the ones to tell me who I was and what I needed to do and so on and so on and so on. Well, I couldn't stay with those people anymore once I understood on a very deep level, not necessarily in a conscious awareness level, but on a very deep level, I understood I can't be here anymore. This is not working. That was essentially how I reacted to that. And so when I left, I ended up going to California and that's when I started opening up and understanding more about the truth of who I am. Mm -hmm. Now, I agree with you hundred percent. Now the kinds of relationships I have are very different with people, but a, a bigger point, something, and you talked about the fear of opening the kimono and becoming more vulnerable. I believe that that is true when we first try it, but the more we do it, the more we understand that it's really not anything to be afraid of at all. And now I've reached a point where I really don't care what people think of me. I don't care. I mean, I, I'm interested in your feedback and in your perspective, but that, and I'm open to using some of that to help me improve my life, but I'm not going to wait for your feedback to make decisions about my life anymore. I'm not going to let your opinion decide who I am. That's the difference. So that's how it's been for me. Gail, you wanted to say something. I'd like to hear your perspective. Oh, gosh, I have so many things I want to say. <laughs> um, yeah, this this piece, Scott, uh, about the, the people in your life and, and David, and I'm sure, Sarah, this is this is probably true for you, too. Right. Um, the people in your life changing when you change, it's inevitable. And, and um, you're right. The first go around. Um, it can be scary. I think that, you know, we're, we're humans, we are wired for attachment, right? We're wired for attachment. We're wired for relationship, even with the modern day society that we live in. That's, you know, I personally think that that in interferes with connection, um, on some level at the, at, at the heart of it, we want to be together. And that can really set us up for some beautiful connections with people, honest, authentic connections with people. And it also can set us up for when we're so attached to being connected, just for the sake of being connected, it can, and it can really create a lot of um, unhealthy connections. So it's normal. So for those who are tuning in and maybe you're in this place right now, I know I'm, I'm, I'm in this place right now. The, the, the people, the places, the faces are changing in my life right now and have been over the last three years. Um, and you know, some of those people you can recognize like, mm, that really wasn't a great relationship for me. And some of those people, you want them to be with you on that journey, but it's really their journey too. Like they get to decide and you can't, bring them with you kicking and screaming. <laughs> they got to decide on their own even, as much as you want to. Right. Um, but it's normal. I guess what I want the, the people who are tuning in to, to know is that it's, 
normal and it's also okay to grieve that to grieve the loss of what you've known and the way that you've been the way that other people have been what you've created up until this point that you can have gratitude for it and appreciation for it and also recognize like you said david you know it's not working for me anymore and it's okay to let it go it's, and it's okay to take your time with it too you know i think that there's a lot of false urgency in our in our society about like well if if it's not working for you fix it fix it right away and and you know just do it and it's a process that in the the letting go the surrender that in and of itself is a process and it's okay to to go at your own pace and to feel what you need to feel and to just take it one step at a time because it's not always easy to to let those pieces go those people those places those situations so that's one thing that i wanted to say and then the other thing that I, I wanted to talk about, I want to come back to story because when I started my business 10 years ago, that was the, my sole focus of my business was helping coaches and speakers and authors um, discover and craft and share their story. And I came at it a, from a very strategic point of view. I have a background in marketing and journalism. And so story has been a, a through line in my life, even from when I was little. And the beautiful thing that happened from creating a business around helping people with their stories is also discovering that it's so much more than marketing strategy it's so much more than you know being compelling or or influential it's really a process for deeper recognition and acceptance and compassion and love for who you've been so that you can then hold that compassion for others in time after you've transcended that story. So the goal isn't necessarily to take that story on as an identity. Like you said, Dave, David, you know, we're the author. It's, it's always happening. We're new every single day. Our story is living, breathing, unfolding alongside of us. Right. And it's not only about rewriting or it's not only about writing, the story as we go along or changing the story or, or having a new story, when you're present with it, you're also changing your history. You're also changing your perspective and your perception of what happened Correct. in the past. So really what you're doing is you're changing your relationship to the story. And exactly. that's, uh, that's, I think, a big, a big, big point. You know, there's a couple of things that you said here that I think are very important. First, we are wired for connection. I think that's a very, very important point. And I, so I want to highlight it and bring it back out. And I think one of the ways that we connect with each other is through our stories. And let's face it, we love stories. I love hearing your stories. I love hearing all the, you know, the ups and downs, the, the hiccups, the everything that, that you've gone through. Because first of all, it helps us to, to relate to each other as, as spiritual beings having a human experience or a, co a com combination of human experiences. That's what I love about it. And I think, I think we all love the story. Think about the hero's journey. Almost every movie you go to nowadays basically follows that pattern. You know, Guys going along, having a good life, falls into this pit of despair, goes through some work, comes out the other side, a hero. That's really the basic of any hero's journey story. And there's all kinds of different variations on that, but that's the idea. So we're not trying to say that there's anything wrong with story. Go ahead and enjoy it. Tell your story as often as you like. Just don't be bogged down by your story and don't be held back by your story. Understand the truth of who you are. You're not that story, but that story is kind of a narrative to help explain how you got where you are today. Yeah, our, Sarah, our, you had something there. A store. Our story is about empowerment of ourselves. Once we, if you like, understand it. But I'd like to go back to sort of something you said. I don't care what you think about me, and I think it's taking taking that thought. We care deeply. 
I believe we all care deeply. But what we are not going to allow is anybody else's thoughts or judgments of us to control us, to affect us. Right. So we do care very deeply. It is just the terminology <laughs> that we we use. It's you know, it sounds as if we don't care. You're you're nothing to us. You're a waste of space, whatever. And it doesn't mean that. It means that's your journey. You know, I, and I'm just trying to think the, the actor who said it. What you think of me and is none of my business. Exactly right. And, and it is it is so true. So it's not that we are uncaring beings. I think quite the contrary. When we step into being our true selves, learn to love ourselves, we can bring so much more of that to other people than we can before we understand ourselves, love ourselves. One, one of the things that came to me when I was working with a client one time, and the words were just there, and they were, I am the love of my life. And I knew that they were for the person I was working with, they were for me, and they were for everybody else in this world. Each and every one of us should be the love of our own life. Yeah, beautiful. That's not selfish because when we are totally true to ourselves, we can bring more. As my sister would say, we can be of service to others. As I said, I hate that word, but you know, sort of, but I know other people think about that word very differently to the way I think about it. And so, Linda, I really hope, thank you. She says, I appreciate that you are sharing your stories um, of being vulnerable. I think I believe we are all sharing it because we've understood the empowerment that our stories have given to us um, to be able to grow from that and then support others. So that's right. that's the sort of sense from all this, and that that is it's the opening of the kimono. It is very much the the getting rid of all the layers, everything that's been chucked on top of us, um, that's hidden who we are um and that we've gone we've dived deep to find who we are yeah beautiful scott go ahead you always bring up such cogent points my dear um was told a long time ago when i was younger if you read alice in wonderland as a child you have a certain perspective as a teen you have another perspective when you read it as a young adult you have a different perspective and throughout your life. It's the same exact story, but we derive different meanings from it each and every time we, we read it. And when we talk about our youth, we're looking at it from our perspective of now. And so we relate much differently to it. And that's, that's how the story loses some of its power over us. Those, those parts of us that were injured and traumatized in those times they don't have the power that they used to, but also we're detached. We can tell it, we can use those stories. The other part about being who you are, the most, I found that the most important thing that, that I, we all probably have, have shown is that we, we need to have boundaries and parameters. And when we go outside of those is when we kind of lose ourselves a little bit and it's, and it's just, by it's not putting us in a box, but it's keeping people and letting them know where they can go and where they can't go. And not ruling us, not us judging them, but living through that. And that's that's where I found in dealing with, with everything in my life now, I take that step back, I take, take a breath, and I look at it and where where is my place here? Before I used to be a bull in a china shop, I would, would go right through it. I wouldn't even think about how it affected other people and it's because that's where I was going. And now I, instead of charging forward, I, I take that step back and I say, how can I fit in this situation? Or should I even be here? <laughs> you know, but I, yeah. but I thank you. Well, one of the things about being a bull in the china shop, you can get rid of all the china. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, so we got about 10 minutes left here, and I think I'd like to shift focus a little bit. 
Um, I mean, we've had some great conversation going on and I really am very, very appreciative of that. But what I'd like to do is maybe offer some suggestions or tips or recommendations for people so that they can begin the process of maybe having less attachment to their story. And I'm going to start with you, Gail. Um, do you have some recommendations about how people can, can use their story to be supportive or as, as Sarah says, empowering without necessarily being too attached to it? Yeah. And I want, I also want to kind of circle back to something that I heard in our conversations earlier. And I think that this is important for that process of, of being a little bit more unattached to your story is this idea of curiosity. I feel like that's the common theme. I think that that's generally the place that each of us have gotten on to our journeys is that that curiosity of what's actually what is this actually about for me what what can i learn from this um and that's not to say right that you don't also feel those feelings of why did this happen to me you know it, it, the sadness the grief the anger around the things that you experience so what i would say as far as really getting up close and personal with your story be be willing to feel the things that come up you don't want you don't want to suppress that and repress that and also get curious get curious about what did you actually learn from that experience what were you know the the negative things can be really sometimes more glaring to us and a, an interesting exercise to go through is to look at that experience, that unwanted experience, and really think about and feel into what were the what were the positive things here for me? What did I what did I learn that I'm actually using as a benefit to me now? And it will start to shift your pers perspective. You know, I can look at I wouldn't wish abuse on anybody, right? Like nobody, nobody would wish that on anybody, I would hope, but it happens. And there are a lot of things about that situation that, that were not great. And there were a lot of things that I learned from that situation that I used to my benefit today. Talk about boundaries, right? <laughs> I mean, that was a crash course in boundaries, all kinds of boundaries, energetic boundaries, physical boundaries, sexual boundaries, all of it, right? So being curious about, hmm, what might actually be beneficial to me in this? And how can I choose to experience this story in a different way that's empowering for me and then also empowering for others? Because really it's like, if you're sharing your story, you're sharing it for the benefit of others too. So what is it in that story? What is the message? What is the lesson in that story that's going to benefit other people as well? And that might be another way to sort of think about it in a more detached manner of imagining that you're in the audience hearing the story and what's your takeaway yeah. from your own story. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Sarah, what uh, op offering do you have for helping people to become, to take the benefits of their story and not necessarily be attached to it? For me, what I did was I knew my story. I knew what had happened to me as a child. And it was why, that was that learning of that, that coming to understand why I'd gone into the protective mode the way I had. Why had I become the people pleaser? Why had I behaved like that? How had I ended up in two marriages that I probably should never have been in? You know, what, what was it within my story? What was it within my behaviors? Why had I been like that? And so, yes, I, I, it was important to seek the help for that. I could not find those answers without seeking that help. But one of the things that I was, you know, was suggested was talk to your mother 
And so I did, and I tried sharing with her how it had made me feel, and she just didn't understand. And when I went back and I said that, she, she said to me, but she doesn't have to understand. She loves you anyway. And so it isn't about people understanding you. It's about you understanding you. That is the important thing because we are all unique. We're all different. We all take things differently. It doesn't matter you said, what your upbringing, your, your experiences, your understanding of words, like my sister and myself and that word service, you know, you'd think we'd been brought up in two different households, right. but we, we haven't, we were brought up in the same household. Mm -hmm. um, yet our understanding of things is very different because we are all slightly wired differently. First. So it isn't about other people understanding you. It is about you coming to understand you Beautiful. and supporting yourself that your story holds no power over you anymore. And maybe that is about support going in and finding somebody can support you if you can't do it on your own, supporting the healing of the inner child. That individual aspect of you that received and experienced the traumas the abuse, the whatever it was that caused that. So it is about our journey, if you like, through and out of our story so that it no longer holds a power over us. Beautiful. Thank you. Scott, I'd like to hear your recommendations. And the, the answer is maybe. You get I'm sorry, the answer is what? The answer is maybe. Oh. You're, you get in a car accident. Someone said, oh, we, that's, you come out of it and you're fine. They say, that's terrible. Well, maybe. Maybe that, that maybe there was, um, if you had pushed the car further in its life, it, you would have gotten in a worse accident. Maybe you get a better car. Maybe you learn that you can't really be doing 60 in a 20 mile an hour zone. Maybe all of those lessons, it's about, what Sarah was saying about understanding about and the, the story of the Chinese farmer who's who said, oh, you have you have these four beautiful horses that came in. So that's great. And he said, oh, maybe his son gets on one of them and breaks his leg. Oh, that's terrible. Maybe they come the next day to conscript soldiers and they take everybody but his son because his son has a broken leg. That's wonderful. He says, well, maybe. So no matter what happens in your life, how you how it's happened, whatever it is, it's maybe because we project anxiety, right? right? It's always we look at this, this one thing that happens and we project it. This is what's going to happen in five days or in five years. Maybe. So understanding that if we if we are present, if we are here, if we take each thing as it comes. Maybe. Maybe it's the best thing that ever happened. And some of the things that are, the best things in my life that have happened, I thought were bad and they turned out to be the best. So I leave people with maybe. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I think uh, the way I look at life now, and I certainly didn't do this when I was a child. Well, maybe I did on some level, but right now, now I look at it as the, 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 the sequence of events that have happened in my life. I didn't perhaps explicitly plan to experience all of those events, but back in my spiritual life, before I came into this planet, I believe that there was a menu of options there for me to look at. And the one that appealed to me was a, a, an option that says, deeply understand and know the truth of who you really are. That was the option that came to me. Now, I didn't understand at the time when I was selecting that option that it would mean going through a long process of giving myself up. But today, I look at that now and say, ha, huh, if I hadn't given up myself, if I hadn't forgotten the truth of who I really am, how could I possibly know it now? And that's the beauty of my story is that it has helped me to, to regain the truth of who I really am, and to help other people 
to do the same thing. That's kind of where the beauty is for me. And I agree with you, Scott, there's a certain maybe associated with it. But if we don't do the deep dive, if we don't look within, we're not going to find that truth. You know, you, you can look outside all you want and enjoy the external views and maybe complain about them if that serves you for the time being. But ultimately, the real truth can only be found in here. Question is, are you willing to look in there? Are you willing, once you found it, to open your kimono and share that with other people? Because that's really what everybody, I think, what everybody wants to see. I think that is what we're all trying to connect to. So that's my thinking on this. Um, so we're about to close, but I want to give both of you, I, I see Sarah had to drop off. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, if, if either of you has something more you'd like to say before I close, uh, I'd like to hear it. Just said, I want to invite anybody who sees this either live or recorded that these wonderful people are here and they're going to be here on a monthly basis. And some of the nuggets that you, you get, you'd have to pay $125 an hour for in, in counseling. Uh, and here you get it for free um, and you get it um, with a smile. So please join us each and every month. Thank you, Scott. Gail, any final words? Yeah, I love what you said about the heart, the heart, really connecting with our hearts and the truth of what's in our heart. And that's not always, it's not always clear to us because sometimes, you know, a lot of us are, are, are living from the neck up and, and very much attached to our mind. And I would encourage the listeners who are tuning in live, tuning in later, uh, to really, really be present with your heart as you're listening to this. I know you're hearing this at the end of listening to it, but maybe listen to it again and really be present to what is going on in your body as you're listening to the stories, as you're listening to our, our commentaries on, on things and just be present with what's going on in your heart more so than what your mind might be talking about <laughs> what we're saying. We're really, I feel that we're really at the precipice of being, being more heart centered. It's been happening for a while now and really living from our mind solely is talk about not working for us anymore. We need right. to be more in our bodies. We need to be more in our heart. We need to really be more connected to our, our intuition and our higher self. And I just, I, I just hope that everybody listening really takes, takes that to heart. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's well, how you start to get to know yourself on a deeper level. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I just want to say, everybody, thank you so much for, for watching this. Uh, if you're, whether you are live or whether you're looking at the recording, I'd like to uh, encourage you to keep the process of empowering your soul going day to day, moment to moment, by staying in the present, as Gail mentioned. I'd also like to remind you that you can follow or you can watch the recordings of this and every other show on my website at yourlifemasterycoach.com. And I hope you'll check them out and keep coming back because we got lots and lots and lots of great stuff to share with you. So I'll just say goodbye for now and I'll see you next time on Soul Empowerment. Bye-bye.